Welcome to Lakai Selakai in the director's chair featuring Claudia Bell Ruiz, founder of Dominican's Love Haitians Movement in conversation with filmmaker Ruben Duran, director of Cimarron Spirit and Colores del Carnaval Dominicano and how the film provides an opening to examine the layers of shared cultural practices across the Caribbean and the specific lineages of celebration and collective expression across the island that is home to two countries. Today's program is part of CCCADI's 10 month series dedicating our cultural programming to Haiti entitled Lakai Selakai, Our Black Nation, exploring the legacy of Haiti. The phrase Lakai Selakai means home is home in Haitian Creole. We will explore home as a space for refuge, building family and community, preservation of traditions, a foundation for cultivating joy and the roots of sovereignty. Lakai is also called to the shared heritage of the broader African diaspora. As a first Black independent republic, Haiti is a freedom home for people of African descent. I am Sabine Blazon, Director of Programs here at CCC ADI. The mission of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute is dedicated to advancing cultural equity, racial and social justice for African descendant communities through arts, culture, education, and media. CCCADI's work is critical to empowering our communities, and I invite you to support our 45 plus year legacy by making a gift of any amount today. Our strength is in our numbers and our solidarity to one another. So no matter how small or large our contribution, know that you're making a lasting impact. So simply click the donate button at www.ccc adi.org. Thank you. I would like to now hand it over to Claudivelle Ruiz, who will moderate today's conversation and introduce our guest panelist, Ruben Durant. Thank you, Sabine, so much. And thank you for welcoming us and inviting us to this conversation in the director's chair. Ruben, we first want to thank you for the work we, you have embarked on as a documentarian in capturing a part of Afro-Taino Caribbean history, especially from the Dominican Republic that historically and politically has attempted to suppress our African heritage, ancestry, and legacy and how we as African diasporic people have survived the ills of colonialism, genocide, enslavement, and what we like to call political amnesia by disparaging and denigrating blackness and the history of black people here in the Dominican Republic. So you open the movie, The Marong Spirit, with a dedication card. This film is dedicated to the resilient and resourceful rebels of Hispaniola from the past, present and future. And so you completed this documentary in 2015. When did you first begin your journey and your interest in this topic? Was it your own rebeldia, rebelliousness and see my own spirit? What was the calling that had you interested in making this documentary? Where was your aha moment in realizing this was perhaps a story that was little known, talked about or recognized? Thank you, Claribel. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you and your audience. And for us, um, I would say that as a teenager, I became uh, someone that was was in, in many ways civilians and trying to find answers to questions I had. Uh, and then as I actually moved and, and became part of the diaspora in, in the US, I started to go back and look for identity our real identity when it comes to not only uh, identity as the, the the fact that we are this or that, but also what do we do as Dominicans to to express our uh, our own uh, identity and emotions and so on. And so I some 14 years ago I started to go back and document identity through carnival. And, and from the documenting, of course, it became very clear to me that the, uh, there was a, a different aspect of those different carnival celebrations 
that we were experiencing in the Dominican Republic. And of course, it was something that united the island, it still unites the island uh, in, in the practices and the beliefs and, and the way that we celebrate this, these different traditions. And so um, this is, this is uh, of course, perhaps the major, uh, the, the, the major push for, for me to become interested and part of, of these communities. And, and it's been amazingly rewarding, uh, but being commu commuting, if you will, with, with many of these uh, rebels uh, of today in the Dominican Republic. I love, uh, I love the fact that you, uh, you said that you, when you came here, that's when you entered into the diaspora. It was like a realization. We hear that a lot with, with many people who, who immigrate here to the United States. They learn that they are part of this diaspora that they may not have been connected to prior to or understands how uh, many different people view us, right? M view people as part of the African diaspora. So, um, and that this journey took you 14 years. So we are so happy that you're here with us today and that you were able to actually um, go back and uh, capture, you know, to really start investigating your identity and understanding yourself a, a little bit better in that time. Uh, right now we're going to go into our first clip. And in this clip, we're going to see now is understanding the history of blackness and Maronage in the Dominican Republic. En 1492 se produce el descubrimiento de América. El objetivo fundamental es la búsqueda del oro por parte de los españoles. Se agota el oro y hay necesidad de sustituir la parte económica y aparece la industria azucarera. En la industria azucarera, para poder realmente funcionar, se trae obligado miles y miles de esclavos africanos. La primera sublevación de esclavos ocurrió en el año 1521 en el ingenio del hijo primogénito de Cristóbal Colón, que se llamaba Diego Colón. Estos esclavos africanos se revelan, se van a la montaña y ese proceso se conoce como el cimarronaje, la búsqueda de la libertad. Entre los líderes del cimarronaje aparece Juan Sebastián Lemba, El Lemba se insurreccionó contra los españoles a mediados del siglo XVI. Eh, fue uno de los caudillos cimarrones más famosos y más temibles de todos los que hubo en la colonia española de Santo Domingo. A lo largo de, de nuestra historia siempre ha habido personas que han luchado en contra de, de a favor de, de nuestra identidad negra. El lugar donde llegaban los negros alzados se llamaban Manieles. El Manieles constituyó el espacio de la libertad. Durante la Semana Santa, los descendientes de estos esclavos, de estos negros y marrones, tienen la celebración por la llegada de la primavera. Pero este carnaval no puede confundirse con el carnaval español, el carnaval europeo traído, ese carnaval de Canestolena. Hoy este carnaval cimarrón se da en los lugares donde hubo movimientos del cimarronaje, pero no porque los cimarrones tenían carnaval, sino porque es un carnaval que entra como respuesta al carnaval europeo. Esta rica herencia cultural de leyendas, de tradiciones, de ceremonias, rituales, es lo que constituye el carnaval cimarrón. Este carnaval cimarrón es una expresión de libertad y una expresión de identidad. So growing up, we would hear, growing up here, we grew up here in the United States. And this phrase, we would, we would hear this phrase from other Dominicans who would say, we have black behind the ears or el negro detrás de las orejas. And Yomara Fortuna, 
singer, activist, and environmentalist states, there has always been people in our history who have fought for our Black identity. Why is that? What has happened or is happening in the Dominican Republic that would create a state of denial of our Blackness and the need to distance ourselves from our African heritage? What did you discover for yourself? Well, I actually was able to trace back uh, through Carnival in our fight for identity as to who we really are, not only the political uh, apparatus, if you will, that in, in many ways was uh, in charge of creating this narrative in where we were a uh, mother land, if you will, with Spain. And, and that's how, uh, in so many ways, denying our other part of our heritage was, was not something that in many ways we embraced. And at this very moment, 2024, uh, there are groups of Dominicans that live here in Houston to whom looking at this documentary is offensive because it's a representation of, of one part of who we are, according to them, that is not really who we are. And so this uh, project and documentary, as, as, it, as long as it took us to work on and traveling and finding many of these uh, Cimarronas and Cimarrones that we found in Xiomara, Dagoberto, Juanpa, in many of these communities was in many ways uh, a, a way for me to become part of that struggle, okay? And a struggle that, that is very alive today because of how we are denying who we really are and, and, and the fact that we're not able to connect what is happening in places like New Orleans with the Mardi Gras Indian celebrations with African uh, uh, Caribbean traditions and how some of that is actually imported from places like the Dominican Republic. And so we're not able to connect anything because it's very difficult for us to know who we are. And, and that is based on this narrative that has been uh, eventually placed in, in our, in our uh, Dominican uh, culture for uh, these, these other interests, if you will. Caribbean. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, it would take a long time for us to have this discussion about what's, what's been taking place on our island. So, um, but we, we really are inspired by those of us who are continuing to elevate our, our heritage and that we are present to what our ancestors have created, have, have produced in the 500 years that, that uh, we've been here fighting for liberation and that we're still fighting for liberation um, as we speak. And so not only on our island, not only in the Caribbean, but worldwide. And yeah. so one of the things that we were really struck by um, and that as soon as we were seeing all the, uh, the, the, the carnival, we were just really struck by how much one of the, uh, we are, we're part of the Yoruba tradition, um, Isheshe. And one of the things that we were really struck by was how, how the costumes really re resemble the Egungun, the Yoruba masquerade, right? And the uh, and Egungun is not only the, it's also ancestor reverence. And as a place of remembrance and celebrations and blessings and protections, warning and punishment. And that is all that Carnival is as well, right? <laughs> there, nice whole essence is is encompassed in all of the experience that we saw in the documentary and so the clip that we're going to um and how potent that is especially for the people for the, for everyone who participates as well as those who take on and emulate the costuming and so we are going to now see this clip it's a brief history on the beginning of carnival que habla de 1510, 1520. Esto llegó con los negros esclavos africanos, porque según nos dicen, según investigaciones también que otros han hecho, 
por aquí cerca había lo que se llamaba un ingenio. Entonces esos esclavos tenían un día al año que le daban libre sus patronos, que era el Domingo Santo. ¿Qué hacían esos esclavos que era su día libre? Se disfrazaban como manera de fiesta, de alegría y salían por las calles. Nacen donde de lo que se es para tener su gran disfraz, se hace en un monte, en uno de los montes más grimosos que pueda haber en estas comunidades. También ellos tratan de ir antes de 15 días antes con un litado donde cada casa de los niños malcriados, que los padres en los tiempos de antes decían, ahí viene el cuco, qué bajo que te va a comer guabá. Esas son frases de que nuestras comunidades, que son eh, lo que es del campo, mantienen esa gran tradición. Cuando se hablaba de los negros, cuidado que los negros vienen, te van a comer los negros, vamos a llamar el negro. Los niños, al ver todo el tiempo, cuando han venido diciendo que te van a comer los negros, y se lleva el litado casa por casa, los niños más malcriados, los más necios, los más malitos que hay, ya el sistema del grupo de los negros, están ellos, se reúnen donde nadie sabe nada, los que componen ese equipo, y hacen su litado. Dice, bueno, en la casa de, de, de Juan Pérez, ahí tenemos a Josecito y tiene un complemento de un listado de ya las personas que van a visitar ellos. Y los niños cuando veían esa máscara y veían eso, se enterraban debajo de la cama. Algo que podían agarrar, llevaban su fuerte, su fuerte y su pela bien dada. Y al otro día, esos niños eran los niños más obedientes. Uh, we always laugh, we laugh at that click when he's, esa, esa fela buena, it's like, <laughs> it real, it give you that good, it's like, how, it's just a funny uh, phrase to say. Um, but, segundo, Salomon Rincon says, there is magic and there is a tradition, there is a tradition that says, if one is dressed as a negro for a year, you are obligated to dress up for seven consecutive years. If not, otherwise, hateful, evil spirits will punish you. And there is this, and this is surrounded by magic that you can feel the, in the in the costumes. That's what we gather from the documentary. That it kind of contains you by how when you're dressed up and in group, and the costumes in and of themselves are magical, um, a purification for the person in acting the tribute and exercising evil spirits. And these exercising evil spirits for young people, elders, and as well as the person in the costume, and in order to bring fertility and goodness back into the community. And so here in, in La Jolla, they're called Los Negros, but in, all, in many of the different um, regions that you documented, they have various different names as well. So we wanted to ask you, was this, this ideology, was this a theme that you saw in the different townships that celebrate Carnival? Yes. Yes, indeed, my bloody bell. And it's very, uh, it's fascinating to me because as you move from Los Negros to Cocoricamos and Ocaga, and you get into deep conversations with the members of those communities, they start revealing uh, some of the, the, not only how the community comes together uh, to, to many ways uh, work to raise a child, if you will, uh it takes a village if you will and then how many of these different beliefs repeat from one tradition to another in a different part of the island and so gaga will also believe that seven days you have to actually as you as you begin to parade the gaga and become part of that gaga uh troops as they go on around the different uh sugar mills in where they are in many ways uh doing the the gaga based on the belief as as you know uh that the the rain is actually going to bring those uh different uh the, you know the harvest as as they expect but the masking and, and going out with the truth is a seven year time frame and the same for cocoricamo if you become part of those groups then it's actually uh, the same in that area. And it's mainly also how 
the beliefs that they have when it comes to even showing their faces. Uh, I don't know if you realize, if you saw that during Los Negros interviews, only one person, which is the main organizer, and he wasn't masking that thing. Everybody else that, is asked, that, that was participating couldn't actually reveal their faces mm -hmm. because they believe that, of course, uh, you know, uh, something, something bad or evil is going to happen to them. And the same for the seven years, if they were to to uh, to abandon uh, the troops uh, during that time frame, uh, they, that's also the belief that they have. So it actually has many similarities uh, from one uh, group to another there, for sure. It's pretty interesting that in Los Negros, like, as you said, that you can't show your face, right? It's a, it's a, in and of itself, you're not allowed to know who that person is behind the mask. Mm -hmm. And in some respect, that is also, uh, we could see how it would be important not to know who that person is. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, it's actually, it's a, cele it's, it's a celebration that is dealing with so many aspects of those communities. So you have the community that is actually purifying the child. Remember, the whips are meant for purification, not only for protection, but also the way that it's even used in regular carnival. Because Simon Rome is not the regular carnival that you find in the Dominican Republic or Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Okay, this is very different. And it's so meaningful and, and so uh, ingrained into those particular communities. And so the actual uh, way in which the uh, the kids are eventually admonished by the community and or the representations of the, the fact that they need to, to hide the, who they are to be able to commit that, that particular function in, in the community. Uh, and, and of course, then you go into the other different meanings, such as the way they dress uh, is, is, is a counter carnival, if you will. It's all coming from those different montes or countryside where those communities are. And, and the only one that would be a little different would be Las Cachuas, and that has a different meaning. But in many of these communities, uh the 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 customs and, and and the materials that they use are recyclable are mainly coming from those communities uh in countryside where these communities are and and so on so we noticed that that in las cachuas these outfits were like these colorful i was like we could go um let's let's buy one of them jumpsuits over here because <laughs> they're they're so beautiful and how they're fabricated um it's not like the other areas where yes it's like found items found textiles found metals bones um and these in, in las cachuas really were like this is some just uh, the creation of it was 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 beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to, me, to me, it's one of it's one of the most beautiful masks in the Caribbean and in, and in in many. I have been to many carnivals in many places, and and the Cachuas has something that is very special, which is once you put a, a, a Cachua mask, it has hair, if you will, because the wind often is actually blowing in the back. Okay, and it looks like this mask is actually, you know, hairy. It has hair that is moving in the back and, and it makes it so beautiful uh, when it comes to, to the way it looks on the streets once you see them wearing them. And of course, the meaning behind what they do uh, in Las Cachuas. Uh, Claribel, I remember you asked the burning of the Judas and the significance of, of that action, uh, which is a culmination of, of all the activities of the day in the cemetery where they are actually honoring the cachuas that have passed but there is another significance for the community which is the burning is not the burning of the judas in the christian tradition although in many people will understand it to be that way but the many uh, participants and organizers of of these traditions and festivities are indeed referring to something very different, which is the calier or the snitch in the Trujillo regime, in which it was someone that could easily point at you and say, this person is anti 
this or whatever. And then all of a sudden you would disappear. It was perhaps one of the most hated and feared characters in Dominican history. And here you have a community that is burning this calier, this soplon, this snitch that the Trujillo regime was actually using to oppress Dominican society. Maybe we can actually see that clip right now that you've kind of like introduced to us. Y luego ya como a las 5 de la tarde bajan en grupo al cementerio con el Judas. Hacen un repique encima de la tumba en honor a todos los cachúas fallecidos. yendo al cementerio como un homenaje a uno de los jefes de Acachua fallecida, pero cogen un Judas. Ese Judas, símbolo católico, símbolo, símbolo cristiano, en ese sincretismo es interesante porque le pegan fuego en las tumbas, en el cementerio, y lo van corriendo mientras las cachuas le van dando fuerte, es un fuerte de purificación. mataron por Calié. ¿Qué significa Calié? Significa Calié que durante el periodo trujillista el nivel más bajo del delator era el soplón y ese soplón recibía el nombre de Calié. Entonces el símbolo en el cementerio de Cabral es el triunfo del pueblo sobre la dictadura, es el triunfo del pueblo sobre la opresión. Es la libertad, es la vida. So thank you for introducing that clip that we just saw a moment ago. And we want to acknowledge that for ourselves personally, that it was difficult for us to watch the burning of this effigy, the symbolic, this symbolism the, of the synchronization of Christianity and the symbol of Judas who is burned and whipped. Um, we felt tension within our own bodies and intellectually we understand we understand that it, it is a form of purification. And we love what um, Dagoberto Tejada Ortiz says, that it is a rise over dictatorship, especially with, with Trujillo. Yet, there is this, for us, there's this historical, tr along with all of that information that we have, there's also this, his this understanding, this historical understanding of how we as Black people have been treated in various parts of the Americas and the Dominican Republic that has been ve very harmful. And so for us, the question is, do the people remember it in, the, in, in, in acting this? Do the people remember this as a rise towards liberation, resistance, and community? Yes, very much so, very much. And you're able to talk to many of the members in these communities as just the conversation, sharing uh, a meal over at the park. And, and the conversation comes back to always, we 
liberated from these different uh, ways in which the oppression was actually uh, not only from the Trujillo regime, but also in many ways for us as, as a society that needs to uh, change the way that we uh, in, in, in many ways treat each other. And, and so the, the fact that many of these communities and the Cachuas and so on are able to do these celebrations during a very uh, holy celebration in the Dominican Republic that is uh, what, you know, is called uh, Good Friday and where they are saying these are traditions that we had been in many ways uh, just participating and doing for celebrations, but also traditions that allows us to express who we are. And that's the way that they eventually decided to do that. Not so much to be related to the Christian Judas, but, all, but more to the dictatorship that was so brittle for, for in many ways. Not only uh, this, this was bad for pretty much the entire island and one, uh, we, one community as a whole, for sure. Thank you for, for saying that, because for most of um, our understanding, there are so many people who always talk about the era of Trujillo as if, um, if that, as if it were not a state of terror that people were in. Um, and so it's, it's important that we recognize that that was, that was what was happening. Um, people were being violated and terrorized during that regime. And so the clip that we're now going to see is how, and also um, as part of that regime, <laughs> now that we're going to actually go into this clip where Giomara, um speaks to us about how Cimarron culture is considered to be primitive and therefore disposable. La cultura del Cimarronaje puede caer en complacer a, a los que le, les gusta llamar a, a las tradiciones de africanas que tenemos eh, como cosas primitivas, porque si marronaje es, es algo primitivo, ¿sabes? Según, según los, los estudiosos que no son afro o, o que, que no quieren reconocer las cosas positivas y buenas de, de la raza negra, tú sabes. Eso también, por ejemplo, el gagá. El gagá no, no es visto como algo positivo y todo en la vida tiene su positivo y su negativo el gaga es una herencia africana que se recrea en haití y en la república dominicana es una manifestación de carácter vocal, musical, con manifestaciones, con rituales mágicos religiosos. Tenemos el gagá del ingenio, que es común también en Haití. Tenemos el gagá de polo en honor a Dambalá y tenemos el gagá de Elias Piña. Entonces el Gagá, como todas las religiones, es una jerarquía y tiene sus rituales, tiene sus, sus ceremonias y tiene sus responsabilidades y sus deberes. Entonces nosotros solamente participamos en la parte festiva del Gagá. Ahora, para tú participar de la otra parte, la parte religiosa, tú tienes que pertenecer. Um, we wanted to ask you, this isn't part of our question, but we, just, we actually <laughs> were inspired by what Xiomara was saying. Were you able to document any of the 
other religious were 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 you allowed into the space as a documentary into the into the religious aspect? Yes, yes, but with the promise that we were not to 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 have that in the documentary. Ah, and how? And, were so for for one of them, there was a very different uh, religious celebration before Gaga went out. Uh, it was mainly a festivity with the palos, which is a sacred Dominican music that is played in many of these communities. And from that, there were other celebrations, especially uh, one that happened in it like perhaps 10 meters, uh, you know, 150 meters from the Astro border where uh, there was there was so freely very interesting uh, happenings in, in, in that particular. And but again, we were not uh, able to make that part of what we were documenting. And, and you know, it, it's it, it's one of the main things that happens as a documentarian, uh, if you are eventually, if you if you say yes to lending a voice to this community so that you, Claribel, can hear them, uh, you know, everything else is me seeing myself as part of those communities. And whatever it comes through, uh, it's not just suggestions, but also how do we keep the dignity of, of many of these amazing people, you know, without in, in, in any way minimize any, any of what they do? Because these celebrations are, are very intrinsic, very much uh, alive in, in, in who they are. So uh, we participated and, and were able to document those, but again, uh, not able to make that into the documentary. Ruben, we're really happy that you communicated that, especially for those who are who are aspiring documentarians viewing this, that it's important as a documentarian that you are respectful to your subjects, that you're respectful for the materials that you're collecting, that, um, that we're creating a space that honors those. And knowing that as a doc documentarian, that you're sharing this spirit and this energy with the person who is allowing you into their most intimate spaces. Um, and that is really important for when someone says stop, that you stop, that that isn't allowed, that you don't continue um, acting in a way that it, that could be, that is harmful for those um, who, are, who are being documented, who are, are allowing you into their most intimate self. Um, and so, one of the things that we also want to say, and earlier in the documentary, Margarita Joanna Florent, who's an artist and documentarian, she says that she re recollects that the hate, the mask is, memor is memorable. And they also have it in the Southeast Haiti, exactly the same. And then later in the documentary, she describes the rhythms of Gaga from Haiti as they have a, a wide variety of rhythms, different from the north to the south. And we can see that as well in the costuming here in the what we, we what we now call the Dominican Republic. Same thing, like the costumes vary in between region to region. And so as Margarita says, they are passing this information from generation to generation. And so per, perhaps this is more of a, a statement than a question. And then maybe we have a question at the end for us is a reminder that although you are documenting regions in what is presently called the Dominican Republic, in the 1500s and 1600s, there was only one island nation called uh, by the Spaniards, Hispaniola, where these symbolic acts were being formed and actualized before there was a black sovereign nation called Haiti, before the Dominican Republic, so we share, this history is shared between us as people who were fighting for our liberty. What do you say to those who would deny, I, I, we, all, we it seem, it seemingly we keep going back to this question as we, we keep seeing this. <laughs> we keep going back to this question, but 
uh, for us is really very important because there are so many people who are unaware. Um, what do you say to those who would deny our blackness in the Dominican Republic? Those who would love, who love to say we're mulatto, we're, and it's, the reality is, who would you who would see the enslavement of people, our ancestors, as an embarrassment versus a testament to our strength, ingenuity, and perseverance of the soul? What do you say to those who would deny that history? Well, I guess they are mistaken and in many ways is is it's almost, you know, it's it's almost a crime, if you will. Uh, it, it's, it's just that this is who we are. And when you are not able to know who you are, then it's very difficult for us to see the fight that Xiomara and Dagoberto and many of them are doing as, as, a, as something that started 500 years ago and is still going on today. And how many of them are not, are not eventually dividing us. They are in many ways uniting. And these celebrations are in many ways that it, it, they're like a lent into what we do very well as one people in, the, on, in that particular island and our similarities and where we come from together before, like you said, Claribel, the uh, independence movement in Haiti and, and so on and so forth. And so for me, the 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 more that I that I'm able to eventually uh, identify in this way and and see all of us as as not only who we are but where we come from, then the the better you know the better humans we are and the better society we would have. But it all starts there. You have to you have to acknowledge what you know, what has happened and, and, and how there are groups of people that has made it into a business of, of denying that as well. But that's not an excuse anymore. We ourselves have to, to overcome that and, 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 and either become part of the movement that is creating awareness and, or if, if at any level, becoming yourself more aware. Of, of who you are and and like you said and, and looking at you know the black in the in the oreja and negro in oreja and, and so on and so forth so the more uh we acknowledge that the less we dehumanize our, our fellow uh dominicans uh haitians and, and, and brothers on the island so mm. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, that is, that is the part that is always the dehumanization of of who we are as a who we are, our ancestors, our elders in our history in, in denying that that dehumanizes us that. And so thank you for thank you for your words. Right now, the clip we're going to see inside of that is the power of the Cimarron. Los padres no, no les gustaban para esos días, era una cosa muy sagrada, el día del Viernes Santo. Y ellos pensaban, yo lo entendí así, como que eso de Gagá era una cosa como satánica. Y totalmente no. Es una división, una cuestión que se lleva desde hace muchos años, pero los padres no les gustaban. Cojo otra vía, pero más nunca más se ha vuelto a meter con nosotros. Nada más fue esa sola vez que él dijo, no, no, no se pueden meter. Y nosotros dijimos, vamos a ir al pueblo porque esto es un juego, señor. Y eso es para que uno esté alegre, para que el pueblo esté alegre, para que uno, es decir, no esté pensando. Padre, déjenos caminar. La policía le dijeron, pero deben darle paso a esas mujeres y ese, esos hombres que... que que gocen, de, que disfruten lo que ellos les gusta. Entonces, ¿verdad? Ya el padre no se mete con eso. A la parte de Haití, 
hay una parte secreto que se llama champuel o bizanco. A veces también se utiliza también la magia fuerte. Se utiliza la, de la magia fuerte porque ellos están peleando por el poder. El gaga es el poder. Lo gaga que es más fuerte viene con polvo, viene con mucha cosa. A veces también se tiene, tiene una devoción, una multitud de devoción con otro. Lo, la santería se dedica con, con un loa, con un espíritu. Aquí se hace lo, lo igual, me en Haití es más profundo. Se lo gaga de Haití, tú puedes estar camin no caminar en carro, caminar a pie. Porque cuando tú piensas que Dios está caminando, hay algo mágico que se puso en el gaga. Tú no te vas a sentir cansada. Tú puedes irte a través del mundo. ¿Me entiendes? Mm. Uh, there's also this part uh, where this gentleman says, as an example, uh, with the power of the carnaval gaga, that they were um that there was no rain and that the, the dust was choking them and then they they did a ritual and then it started to rain and so for us that that clip here is a reminder of the power of our, our history with Judy Bookman at the boys commons uh came in we're, we're mispronouncing that this is so this 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 um uh, this clip for us with the is a reminder of the power of Duty Bookman at the Boys Common Ceremony in 1791, where he's enacting a spiritual ritual and beginning the revolt against France that would lead to the first Black Republic and Haitian sovereignty. So Ziomara states, Marunas has been defined as a specific moment in the history of colonization. And certainly many of us today can say that Marunas did not end there, as we've been state, as you've been stating as well. There is this whole maroon culture that includes black people who dare to speak out and they call us Cimarron. So using the power of Cimarronage, what future do you see and can you envision for the island for both Haiti and the Dominican Republic? Well, I envision a future of unity overall, but if I were to go back to these particular communities that were so lucky to document, I would say that the, the reason why at the beginning of the documentary, we say that the documentary is dedicated to the Cimarrones of the past, present, and future is because we can see how many, many folks in these communities are starting to also rebel against some of the, some of the traditions that are in many ways colonial traditions, right? And so what Kum Kum is referring to when she says, leave us alone, this is not something that is evil, and you do your church worship the way you do, and so do we, because in many ways, many of these uh, members of these communities are also uh, Catholics or Christians themselves, and or, or they acknowledge themselves as such. But what they're saying is, you need to also understand what we're doing and allow us to do it. So then you do have a fight in these particular communities that are not so big communities. You know, not not so big of a community, but in these small areas, you have these fights in which the Gaga chieftains are saying, "Look, you know, we need to be able to celebrate as well, and this is the way we do it, and it's not evil." And in spite of what you think, and you also have to revise the way you think, because you have to understand that that's a colonial mindset when you think that way. Just the way that we think when. When a tourist from Europe comes in, uh, you know, this is a tourist from Europe. It's very different than a tourist from another place comes in uh, and, and so on. So that colonial mindset, I see how many, uh, many of our uh, Dominican groups in many of these communities, they are actually fighting the fight. And it's slowly but surely they are also winning some battles, if you will. So this that Kunkum is describing 
It's a battle that they fought and they won. Because mm -hmm. now Gaga will actually go out in Semana Santa, which is where these celebrations actually happen. Because it's not connected to the carnival in Spain and in Europe. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a very different expression of identity and and, and freedom that, that is nothing to do with how the Trump style carnival uh was born out of the church in Europe. Mm. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> we we love that our that African pride <laughs> and and knowing that this celebration is not you know is not part of this Europe Europeanization that it is totally totally immersed inside of our African heritage and um and so we appreciate that very much we appreciate this conversation that we've had with you today and we also before we close is there what's is there anything that we should be aware of um what's coming up next for you in 2024 well i am eventually uh i'm taking a hiatus from from documentary uh but i'm i'm planning on going back because there are so many different projects that are really happening that are very exciting in the Dominican Republic. And, and I, you know, I became, now I'm part of this community that I love and, and I want to continue to, to contribute and or to learn and, and, and continue to become part of, of these amazing folks that, that I have the honor to, to meet and, and befriend. And, and so that uh, I hope. But more than anything, uh, I think we need to continue the struggle to, in many ways, uh, you know, continue to tell these stories, to change the narrative, uh, and to continue to also empower those in the island that are also fighting the fight. And, and empowering is, is, is not so much, let me say, $100 to Dagoberto, uh, but I would make it a point that every book that is published by Dagoberto is going to make it into many different libraries in the U.S. that people can actually read the story from a very different narrative. And so we have actually built a Dominican identity book area in the International Folklore Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where there are many of the books that deal with Dominican celebrations, identity, that are part of that library that we have been able to, to send or take there. And, and so that will be my hope that I can continue to, uh, to, to continue to be a part of, of this uh, community that is actually uh, fighting in, 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 in so many ways, keeping these traditions, uh, you know, in, in intact. Thank you. Well, as part of our as part of our initiative, you can see Simaron Spirit in person uh, Thursday, March twenty eighth at six thirty p.m. as part of our New Acoma New Synergy Haitian Dominican Transnational Film Festival, and um, in collaboration with Third World Newsreel and DocuForum at CUNY City College. And so, we'll be providing more information. Um, down in the summary and also uh, in on our website and, and uh, wherever we may be with with, with Kadi <laughs> uh, to support to support continuing understanding our this important history that we that um, that we share. So thank you very much, Ruben, for this conversation with you today. Well, it was a pleasure, uh, Clary Bell, and um, I'm actually so happy that uh, to know people like you and, and, and Mario and, 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 you know, the work that you all are doing, Sabine, uh, the work that you all are doing is, is very meaningful. And so I, I hope it will continue and grow. So thank you. Thank you.